evening and welcome to Meticulous Moments. My name is Yonita Kapp. You can reach me at meticulousmacarons at gmail.com or find me on LinkedIn. Since the COVID-19 pandemic hit the globe, I've had the wonderful privilege to meet a wide array of fantastic individuals. These individuals have truly touched my life in so many positive ways. Amongst this group of people, there are authors, public speakers, life coaches, poets, leaders and visionaries. They are the unsung heroes of our time. Therefore, I decided to start the Meticulous Moments movement out of a sense of my gratitude. It is my way of giving back to the community. Let us share and reshare their stories in an effort to build a better society. Good evening, everyone, and welcome here at the Meticulous Moments podcast, where we facilitate community upliftment through leadership development. This evening, I have the wonderful privilege of spending time with the amazing Barry John Mulder. And we have so many things in common. Not only are we both South African, but we are both martial artists as well. And we are business owners. It was so lovely to connect with BJ and to really just share information regarding the topic of leadership. He really brought a lot of, lot of aspects of leadership and gratitude to the table. And this panned out to be an amazing interview. Thank you, BJ, for coming on to the Meticulous Moments podcast and for bringing so much value. And uh, we had technical difficulties during the, co- the course of our recording, but we lasted and we endured and persevered. And it, we, it became really a true pleasure to bring all of that knowledge to the force. So thank you so much. I appreciate you. You are now part of the Meticulous Moments family. A little bit more about BJ. He's a business owner and the founder of Project Relentless. And we also discuss what Project Relentless is about. So I would encourage you to watch the full interview. And he studied at Wits University, the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. The moment he lives in Spain with his beautiful family, his wife and his three boys. It's such a blessing to know you. And to the audience, sit back and enjoy this session as we dig deep into the topic of leadership. Have a lovely, lovely day, everyone. Good evening, Meticulous Moments audience. Thank you so much for joining us for yet another enlivening session here at the Meticulous Moments podcast, where we facilitate community upliftment through leadership development. And today I have the wonderful privilege of spending time with the amazing and my good friend, Barry John. How are you, Barry? Hi, Juanita. Thank you very much. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for doing this with me today. And, you know, we've put on Messenger and, uh, you know, we've had uh, two virtual coffees and we couldn't stop talking because we have so much in common, including being South African citizens. So I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to ask, you know, would you, for the, for the members of the audience that are not acquainted with you yet, would you please just introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. I really appreciate you. Uh, giving me the time to come and spend some time with you. And my name is Barry John Mulder. I am the creator of Project Relentless. It is a program that I designed for ambitious men and women who not only want to bring very high levels of focus, productivity, and health into their life, but they want to create a life worth remembering and live a life worth remembering. I love it. I love it. And I, and that's something that uh, really struck me since the first time that we met. You know, you are very relentless in everything that you do. You, you carry that, uh, that energy with you. And who better than to teach the people that you engage with? So I'm very blessed to have you here today. I like people that are relentless. I like people that never give up. And I want as an audience and myself to learn and grow from your experiences today. So I want to ask you, you, uh, you have a South African heritage. Tell us more about that. We yes. are both South African. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my family, I have a very big uh, family, um, <laughs> really big on, on, especially my mom's side. Um, my dad's side are, are South African English, um, and my mom's side are Italian Irish and original settlers, 1820. So my mum's great-grandmother, or potentially great-great-grandmother, 
um, she was on one of the great treks up north. So my mom still got all her diaries and everything. She was a young girl in the ox carts, uh, traveling, traveling up, uh, up north into what is now, you know, Zimbabwe, Rhodesia back then, or, you know, there's, there's all sorts of names that have, that have changed over the years. Yeah. And, you know, uh, on the other side, the Italian heritage from Stella and Bologna and yeah. that heritage uh my my great great grandfather he had a fishing business in bari uh in italy that he expanded to isma in turkey and from there he sold off that business and moved to south africa and he wasn't he wasn't given a work permit um because of his very dark yeah. olive complexion uh, and he oh. actually went off he moved to he, he was in Cape Town, but he moved to Franschhoek and he actually, he was the original owner of the land that Lamotte Vineyard and Winery is on in, in Franschhoek. And as we spoke about um, before, just on, on one of our virtual coffees, the, the really strange thing for me, a uh, really beautiful thing, I guess, uh, surprising at the same time was when I took my wife back to South Africa. Uh, we had a, a, a two week sort of break out there together. Uh, I didn't, I didn't know, but I took her to Lamont winery and well, they use Catalan, uh, Spanish vines and, and yeah. uh, South African vines. So it was, yeah, it was quite, quite romantic. And yeah, so, wow. uh, you know, my yeah, long, long heritage, long heritage of military service uh, on both sides of my family. Wow. Uh, in Rhodesia, South Africa, uh, in the Royal Air Force in, uh, in World War II in Great Britain. Um, my grandfather flew, uh, hurricane, uh, fighter, fighter aircraft, um, in North Abyssinia. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's where my, my, my dad has his British passport from. And it was a route that I was, uh, I, I had two routes, I guess, that I wanted to follow. Um, I, I've always felt compelled to serve. And at one point I was considering going into the seminary as a priest. And then I found sport and high school and, and all that. And the other side that I considered was also, I, I had my papers to join the paratroop regiment, uh, in, in Britain. And yes. I, I decided against that, uh, because I was working at a school in Oxfordshire. Uh, Radley College for boys, a uh, very well-known, uh, established, uh, you know, public school in in Great Britain, along the lines of Harrow and Eton and 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 the like. And there were some boys that were, you know, injured and killed that had left the the previous year. And I kind of stood there and I was like, oh, maybe maybe this isn't my fight, you know, um, maybe maybe this isn't my fight. So. I stepped away from that and yeah, <laughs> then what feels like the blink of an eye, I uh, lived in the UK for 12 years, uh, got my master's degree and married three amazing boys, an incredibly beautiful, supportive and strong wife um, who has, uh, you know, been at my side uh, through thick and thin. She is absolutely incredible. That is fantastic. You have such a wonderful heritage. You have such a wonderful story to share. And just to see, you know, how you really uh, set your roots, you know, in Europe as well and raising your children yeah. there and all the morals and the values that are healthy for yeah. them. So this is just amazing. Uh, you are the living example of what a good, solid family unit is supposed to look like. And, and I commend you on that because the world Thank you. I appreciate that. that. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's, it's, a it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting point you make because it's always something yeah. I get, you know, like I always say to my wife, I'm not, look, please, I don't, I don't have the most perfect relationship in the world, nor do I want one, right? I, I want to work at it continually, but I'm, I'm, I'm really, um, you know, with the work that I do with the busy, very ambitious professionals that I work with, business owners, you know, it, some of the things that I see, some of the, the, the issues that, and I'm not a relationship advisor or coach or anything like that, but 
a lot of the the problems that come up you know th- there's amazing progress happening you know professionally and there's amazing progress uh financially but in the other two three areas health you know energy relationship there there's a lot of broken pieces there you know a lot of broken pieces a lot of broken relationships and i think a lot of it comes down to values you know i i, I wholeheartedly believe that my wife and i have got through the struggles that we've had as a as a couple as a dating couple you know courtship marriage because we have values yeah. you know family is a big thing family is a big thing for us trust is a big thing loyalty beautiful just saying saying what you feel you know even though sometimes you know because i love to cook and it initially it really used to hurt me when my wife would be like this this isn't really that nice you know and i'd be like oh and take it really <laughs> but you know what it's not it's not personal i think the more that we grew the more that we the we the we grow you know it's like hey actually you know what take that on board you can either be a victim you can be you know made powerless by it or you can actually go you know what yeah. thank you for the feedback okay what what can i do better so yeah i mean it's it's been a it's been a it's been a wild ride it's been a wild ride for me to be honest uh, <laughs> a lot a lot a lot has happened it's a journey yeah so oh, yeah <laughs> Oh yeah, full of peaks and troughs. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's life. That's life. That's what makes it interesting and that's how we grow and uh, you know, it it's wonderful to see that you that you can share that with the audience because I'm sure there's people in the audience that go through similar mm-hmm. things and they can relate yeah. and that's always a good thing. Now, uh, tell us a little bit. You are quite the rower. You went up to professional uh, level. Uh you Yeah, tell us more. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, uh I I kind of I kind of fell into the sport of rowing because my parents thought that I didn't really have a chance of making friends. So I was actually I was actually really into tennis. I love tennis. And I've spent some time at the, as as a you know, in my one of my former careers as a as a strength and conditioning coach. Spent a lot of time uh, or or some time rather at Rafa Nadal's academy and tennis is something that I really love uh, and played uh, quite a lot as as a youngster and I got to the point I started rowing I went to King Edward the 7th high school in Johannesburg and oh. yeah we have a we have a very very uh, long heritage of 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 sportsmen from there Gary Player the golfer Dr Ali Bakha Adam Bakha Neil McKenzie cricketers um yeah, Brian Abana a world cup winning springbok malcolm mark same thing uh, many many athletes and i kind of kind of went on this rowing camp as a way to meet other boys who were going into their first year of high school and i just got thrown on a rowing machine uh, which if anyone in your audience has had the displeasure of being on i still have a love hate relationship with it. i still still spend time on it you know most weeks but I still hate it every time I look at it yeah. I get such such <laughs> fire building up inside <laughs> me when I look at it and um I yeah I just I kind of fell into it and then I, I you know I just said to myself I was like well I'd really like to go to the Olympics and see if I can see if I can be an Olympian at this because I'm pretty good at it um you know I've got all the dimensions and I I guess I've always been fortunate to have great coaches and mentors around me it's it's something uh you know the, my my dad knew someone who was from the UK who was a cox so he used to steer the boat and he was uh is a former yeah. navy diver in, in the South African uh, navy um you know about the size of a pint glass um, I'm sure Cliff will be oh. pretty pr- pretty unimpressed with me mentioning that but he you know he was a bull terrier who who thought he was about six foot six foot tall and You know, he he taught me he 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 taught me a lot you know about what would be required um and I dedicated my entire life to essentially making this dream come true um I I was fortunate enough to represent my country at the junior world championships and from there was inside I guess what would be the feeder club Old Ed Wardians which had a lot of the senior south african and under 23 athletes uh were either there or at ravens 
and I was rowing with, yeah. you know, men that I'd kind of, you know, seen win silver medals and Henley Royal Regatta and all that. And I was like, whoa, this is, this is different. And, you know, I unfortunately broke my, my ankle in a car accident the year that I was going to be oh. moving uh, into the under 23 uh, trials. And, you know, I kind of look at it, you know, I look at it, now, obviously, with uh, you know, with a giggle, and uh, and and I, I look at it as a a huge, you know, uh, with huge thanks, really, yeah. because I would not be where I am in the position that I am doing the things that I am in the world. You know, uh, I wouldn't have taken the journey that I've taken. And you know, long story short, I was hit by a four by four vehicle which ran a red light. Oh. Um, hit me at a hit me at a hundred and twenty kilometers an hour. My goodness. For your for your audience that are, you know, uh, miles per hour. That's uh, yeah, that's pretty. Yeah. That's pretty quick. <laughs> so, over over two hundred miles an hour. Uh, I have no idea. I think uh, you know, if you don't believe that there is something there, whether it be God or Allah or Buddha or whoever. I was, yeah, the surgeon asked me the same thing because I, I had a seatbelt bruised into, into my body. My goodness. And, and that happened to you and you are here today and you are alive and well. I mean, yeah, what, yeah. What, what went through your mind as that happened? Um, given, given that I was a very impulsive uh, young man at the time, uh, you know, 21, 22 years old. I tried to punch the driver of the other vehicle and ended up standing on my ankle, which broke uh, really badly. And then I passed out. Um, and I woke up and I was trying to fight the paramedics because I just bought a new pair of, pair of Essex, uh, I think Essex Gel Nimbus. I don't know, I'm sure they still make them. Ooh. But um, yeah. yeah, they were cutting they were cutting my shoes off because my ankle expanded so much, and I was trying to fight them, so they had to sedate me. And, yeah, and then uh, yeah, I, I put my parents through through a bit when I was growing up, um, and yeah, so I think in that time while I was healing, I had I had a very, a very, a very direct, very brilliant uh, orthopedic surgeon. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't remember his name, but, you know, he, he, he has me doing all the things that I'm doing now because he was very curt with me. He was very direct. He said, look, you're going to sit on the sofa for the next six weeks. You're not going to move because if you don't, you'll never walk properly again. Uh, it was, a, it was a really bad break, broke right into the joint. It was, it was quite a mess. There's all pins and everything in there. And, uh, yeah, so I, I listened and then I kind of sat there and I was like, okay, well, I'm studying sports science now. I really love, you know, performance and I'm always interested in weight training and I'm always interested in strength and speed. And I'm, I, I love it. You know, human performance in any, you know, whether it's meditation or ice baths or altitude training, whatever yeah. it is, I'm always looking at like, wow, like we don't actually know what our limit is. We, you know, because the brain limits us. The, the brain has an internal governor that says, okay, I don't like this. You know, I'm I'm gonna just shut off, and and the more we can keep that, you know, little mongrel quiet, well, we don't know what we're capable of, do we? You know, it, it's the reason that we have individuals like Wim Hof, you know, climbing the death zone in his underpants and no shoes, and people doing these crazy dives and swimming under ice, and you know, soldiers, soldiers, you know, surviving, you know, huge, you know, huge uh, conflict and and making it out the other side. Uh, all because of the 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 mind, really. You know, the, just the body, just listening. And while I was sitting there, I was like, "Well, you know, I'm not really happy with what we're doing. Uh, I don't agree with our training programs and what have you that we're doing." So I went and looked for my own coaches. I went and started asking some questions, and I started contacting people all over the world and other. And I started getting all these different ideas together. And when I could start training again, I started getting faster. So I wasn't, I wasn't fit by rowing standards, but I was strong. Uh, I was, I was weightlifting and clean and jerking and doing all sorts of, 
you know, a performance training that I'd never done before. Um, you know, and I've, I've got my good friend Darren Anthony and, and his father, uh, Andrew Anthony. They are, you know, father, son, probably, you know, Darren is the most successful uh, men's weightlifter in the history of South Africa, uh, an Olympian, Commonwealth medalist, you know, African champion, etc. And he's trained with some elite coaches. And, you know, that opened my whole world up to this other side. And, and, you know, they essentially explained it to me. And it's always an analogy that I've carried with me. They were like, well, your fitness is here. Your conditioning is here. But your strength is here. You know, and your speed is here. And all these things are here. You need to lift these levels. And and that that's something that's always, you know, I was kind of like, wow, that's actually a great point. So I yeah. started getting faster. I started butting heads a lot with, um, you know, the, the coaching setup. And eventually I, I drift away and started moving into my own coaching. And I was looking at the junior rowing scene in South Africa. And I was like, wow, we, we have, I mean, we do. I mean, like I always used to joke. I was like, wow, can you imagine putting Bucky's Buerta in a rowing boat? I always used to say that. I was like, this is 120 kilograms of just <laughs> pure fury. You know, um, I was, uh, we have, we have our, heri- our, our bloodlines are, we have big people, you know, we have Lebanese bloodlines, Italian, Portuguese, yes. Dutch, English. We got huge people. I mean, it, I mean, yeah. it only takes a, you know, it only takes a weekend out at Potterstrom or Monument or Pretoria boys to go watch some rugby, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's not even, that's you not see. even talking about the, the women's, you know, the women's netball, you know, that's, the, you know, we've got, we've got really big people yeah. in the country. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, true. and I was like, yeah. So I was, I was very fortunate. I, I just kind of, I, I guess that's where the entrepreneurial journey started. You know, to be honest, I was just, I was just concerned about getting some money for some petrol to get training in Pretoria and that sort of thing from Joburg. Um, but then my athletes started winning. You know, I had a whole off season program set up and I had permission from the rowing clubs to use their motorboats. And, you know, I, to date now, I've worked with over a hundred athletes that have, uh, from junior level that have gone on to represent internationally. Uh, some of them world champions, some of them state champions in, uh, in the U S some of them Olympics, you know, um, Henley medal winners, all that sort of thing. It's, it's, yeah, it's incredibly rewarding. And, uh, I just figured, you know, because I was, you know, I, even though I didn't, I didn't admit it at the time looking at it now, looking at it, you know, even six years ago when I kind of started turning my whole life around as much as I wanted to go to the Olympics, I just wasn't good enough. That, that's the, you know, that, that was the reality. I wasn't good enough. I, I didn't, I didn't have that next gear. Um, you know, and speaking of gear, that was, you know, what I was thinking. I was like, wow, well, I'm kind of going to have to take some steroids here to start unlocking the next level, Ooh. you know, to, and I kind of looked at it and I was like, look, knowing what I know and studying what I'm studying, I know this stuff will work. I just morally can't be up there mm. taking credit for something that I, you know, that's not natural. You know, that, yeah. like, I haven't like, because, you know, recovery is the key, right? Like, you know, yeah. steroids aside and all that sort of thing, they help with recovery. Uh, you know, they help with recovery. And, and that's, that's kind of when I went, okay, cool. Um, you know, it's time for me to step away here. And I guess the, the anger at not having fulfilled my, my, my goal, yes. you know, uh, that, that, that I really started driving. I, I mean, I look at the training programs that I wrote my athletes and they joke about it now and they're like, wow, you know, we, I'm still in touch with a lot of them. Yeah. And, and look uh, at it. Yeah. They look at it and they're like, you were crazy. And I was like, man, I just wanted to win so bad. You know, yeah. um, I just wanted to win so bad. And, yeah. you know, I, I just, I knew what it would take to, and, and, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to do some work with Oxford University Boat Club in, in, in the UK. I've worked with some Olympic athletes, Olympic champions, world champion athletes in rowing. Um, and, you know, yeah. 
really, you know, really great things. I mean, it was more, I, w- I was working in a college boat club. So mm-hmm. Oxford University is made up of 42 colleges and each of those colleges have boat clubs. And, you know, there's a, there's a massive misconception that the rowing is an extremely high level. And I kind of looked at it and I was like, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to create something here. And, and we did, you know, we, out of, out of the, the four years that I worked in that program, we had 11 boat race winners. So that's the Oxford Cambridge boat race, whether wow. they are lightweights or, or heavyweight athletes. Uh, but most of those guys, mo- most of those men and women were also, they were brought up through the ranks. They were built through the boat club, you know. And that, that was, you know, the, the, the Pembroke College Boat Club, you know, shout out to anyone who catches this. Um, yeah, it was, you know, it was kind of a, yeah. a marriage really that really worked because uh, <laughs> they kind of phoned me and, uh, they interviewed me over the phone in South Africa and said, Oh, you know, when, when are you coming? And that sort of thing. And I was like, right. So being South African, the visa is uh, tending to be yeah. a bit of a problem. Um, Ooh. But yeah, beautiful, beautiful journey. <laughs> and I ended up in Oxford um, and it was minus 17 when I arrived in January of 2010. And that's cool. being an African, I was in flip-flops and shorts with a waterproof jacket by, I think it was Carrymore. Uh, I think I bought it from Due South in uh, the yeah. south of Johannesburg. Yeah. And I nearly died when I walked out of Heathrow Airport. Mm. I, I still, I still remember getting on the bus, and the bus driver was like, "Can I take your bag, sir?" I was like, "No." I was like, "I'll just sit with it here in the bus." He's like, "You from South Africa?" I was like, "Yeah." Yeah. He's like, "Your stuff will be safe. Don't worry. <laughs> You're just gonna put it in the." I was like, "I was like, I'm just gonna sit at the front here so I can watch in the mirror." He's like, "Okay," and. So I spent most of my, you know, first trip or second trip rather, because I was in London very briefly in 2008. Um, yeah, watching that no one ran up to the bus at a red light and stole my bags. And uh, yeah, so I had a great time. You know, I, moved, I, I arrived in Oxford. I started studying there, uh, did my master to, uh, master's in sport and exercise nutrition. And I got my master's degree from Oxford Brooks University, and uh, it was a great time. Uh, I met my wife oh, uh, on that on that course, and we were we were good friends. We were good friends, and then uh, you know, as she would say, I spent the whole summer fishing, <laughs> continually uh, checking in with her and seeing what she's doing, and and yeah, and then uh, twenty thirteen, we ended up getting married, and so. And and the journey hasn't hasn't uh, hasn't stopped from there, right? Um, so yeah, pretty crazy. That's amazing. Pretty crazy. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now you, we talked about you, um, you know, being relentless and not giving up, and really uh, just being a go getter. And I can hear through what you've shared. You know, when the going gets tough, you are the tough that gets going. So I want to ask you, uh, your charity. Uh, projects. I know that you have yes. a project, Relentless. Would you like to describe yes. that to the audience? Yeah, so I am, that, that's, you know, in terms of, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to come across as morbid, but I do, I do. I think about my death very often. You know, what, what happens at the end of my life? Um, who's going to be there? You know, who, who's going to be sharing that time with me. So one of, one of the big projects that I have, uh, that came to me, you know, one day while I was meditating and, and was, I wanted to start, or I I want to, you know, I need to start a charity called the project relentless charity. And my, my goal behind it is essentially I want, I want to have the charity help a thousand families. Uh, to begin with, you know, a thousand families where, you know, mum and dad or mum, single mum, single dad, grandmother, you know, who, who's unable to send their child to an ice hockey camp or they can't afford uh, tutoring or, hey, we have this really bright young woman here who's who's really interested in becoming a doctor. 
And I would love to have, you know, I, I, I've, I've got that connection. Uh, I've got that network um, to be able to go, hey, you know, Karen, you know, can we speak to someone at, 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 at uh, Radcliffe uh, or at Harvard? Can we get this young girl, uh, you know, onto the admissions program? You know, uh, I know yeah. some fellows uh, at Stanford and, and that sort of thing. So yeah. I, I just thought about that because one of the biggest things that I saw in, in my previous career as a strength and conditioning coach, uh, working, you know, with teams and, and individual athletes, mm-hmm. especially in the team setting, was the amount of athletes that just slipped through the cracks because the systems weren't there. Mm-hmm. The systems weren't there to bring them up, to, to uh, cultivate them at their own speed uh, you know, it was just a case of thrive or survive, you know, thrive or, or don't survive. And, yes. you know, I kind of looked at it and I was like, wow, how many doctors are we losing? How many, you know, cancer research people, how many yeah. astronomers are we losing? How many oh, yes. Olympic gold medalists are we losing? You know, how many just, you know, I don't know, any fantastic uh, pastry chefs are we losing? You know, I was kind of sitting there and I was like, wow be so great to be able to give these young people access to uh, resources number one number two yes. mentorship from people who've been there you know like uh, just thinking about it being you know having having an olympic gold medalist be like hey how are you doing today like you know how are you feeling about this this test and just having that network because one of the biggest things that i found and um you know growing up Growing up, yeah, I still, I still wonder if I have grown up, but um, it's more a, it's more a case like <laughs> I wasn't, <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't really taught any emotional intelligence growing up, you know, and you know the oh. things like, hey, sometimes, sometimes it's actually yeah. good to just not say anything, you know, or. And it, it's not it's not because my parents are bad people or anything like that. My parents did the absolute best that they could. But you know, we've all we've all got you know things that 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 we learn and see and want to change. And I was like, wow, you know, I, I wish there were some people that I hurt, you know, because I was just impulsive yes. and, and just wasn't a nice person. Or hey, you know what? I could have been a little bit more loving or a little bit more nurturing. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. hey, I could have been less sympathetic because, you know, empathy would have actually helped that situation. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, that that's kind of where that, – and, and then I, that that's really what the gist of it is with Project Relentless is, is providing mentoring for young people to give them access to the skills, to give them access to the people, and to have them build a network before they even get out into the world. You know, because unfortunately – it's it, it you know we have we have suicide rates through the roof in teenagers in every demographic you know divorce and uh, there's so much going on so much going on uh, you know and it's 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 heartbreaking because I I almost ended up there myself you know 2012 I nearly took my life. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I was just in a in a very dark place. I had no money. I, I was living in Coventry, in the United Kingdom, and no disrespect to anyone from Coventry, but it, you know, not, not, not my first choice of you know where to live. Um, you know, I was I was alone. I was in a room. Uh, yeah. By myself in a shared household, um, and it was just a very dark time, you know, and mm. and. Yeah, I just, you know, kind of uh, at the time I was trying to get my South African passport back from the UK border agency because I'd applied for my post-study work visa. They had lost my passports and there's a whole big court case going on and which was kind of funny at the same time because they wanted me to leave the country and I kept saying, okay, well, I don't have a passport, so I can't leave exactly. anyway. So. <laughs> so yeah, so I couldn't yeah, and and you know, it's the dark time. I, I racked up huge amounts of credit card debt because I, I had to I had to live somehow. Um, you know, my parents, mm-hmm. bless their souls, were were, you know, very kind and, and, and my in laws and helping me. You know, my in laws now. Um and yeah, it was a it was a dark and, and I just got to the point I was like, you know what, like I phone every single day to speak to someone to get an answer. I, I just speak to a, a robot voice. Oh. I'm, I'm done. 
you know, like I'm, I'm done. Like yeah. I, I can't, I can't take this anymore. And you know, I was, uh, yeah, not, not my proudest moment, but I, I really feel, I really feel in that, mo- you know, in that moment, two questions popped up. You know, one was, is this all you're going to be? Is this it? Mm. And you know, and uh, yeah, is this all you're going to be? And is this it? And I kind of, mm. I mean, it, it freaked me out a little bit. I was like, okay, this is weird. But, you know, sat with it, didn't do anything about it, kind of buried it, buried it, carried on. You know, uh, I, I was, I talk a lot to my, my coaching clients and, and groups about uh, dark energy and light energy. And, and I'm not into the whole woo woo, you know, positive self help thing. Yeah. But, you know, th- there's a, like that dark fuel, that anger, there's only so much willpower that you can exercise right and 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 that's what i ran on pushing my teams pushing myself you know trying to get all these things done and in 2016 i found out that my first son alex was going to be born Mm. and it was like being hit by one of those massive like wrecking balls you know and (laughs) it, it floored me because the first thing the first thing and i never I didn't tell my wife initially, but I was like, no, I don't, I'm, I don't want it. You know, I don't, I'm not. Mm. Uh, and, and it was more, more because deep down I knew that I was not the standard. I, I was a, not fit enough to be a father. I was absolutely not mm. fit enough to be a father. Um, yeah, and knew. Yeah. yeah, I knew, I, I, I knew right then and there, I was like, well, you know, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to feed this anger and this resent and this unfulfillment and this frustration with my life. I'm going to feed it to my child. It's already, you know, hurting my relationship. You know, yeah. I, you know, my wife describes me as a stone wall. Like I just didn't let anything inside. And, you know, truth be told, it was, I just didn't, I just didn't want to be hurt. You know, I'm actually, you know, I, I know that, in my socials, obviously there's a full story behind these things, but I'm actually a really soft, gentle person. You know, I, I would never hurt a fly. You know, I, I, even a rat could walk across my table and I, I wouldn't kill it. You know, I'd try and get yeah. it outside. Um, but I, I knew that I had to sort something out. So I went and found a coach. I went and found a meditation teacher. I went and learned from relation. I went to relationship workshops. I did extremely hard things, uh, you know, special forces selection marches with 24 kilos uh, in a backpack. Or just to, just to get rid of my own BS, for lack of a better expression, you know, to actually show myself, hey, you make all this stuff up in your head and you make all of this as heavy as you want to make it as heavy as you want to make it that's how heavy you're going to make it and you know i can't i kind of sat there and i was like wow you know uh, i want my i want my boy to be able to look at me and go i can do anything you know i can do anything you know my yeah that that's 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 what i wanted you know it didn't Money, money is important, yes, but it 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 for me because I I never had enough. I never had so anything I got, I just spent, and you know I had to learn about money. I had to learn good habits. I had to learn, you know, I'm still learning about business. Still, you know, to this day, I don't have any formal qualifications. I just know, you know formal qualifications in business. I just know that in my head. I want to be able to have a life where I have a choice, you know, I choose, I choose what I want to do. And and if my boys come to me and they say, Hey, you know, I'd, I'd really like to be able to do this. I don't want to have to sit there and count and, you know, I just done, you know, if, if you're going to treat it with respect, you're going to look after it. You're going to finish what you start. You're going to show up. You're going to learn. Okay. Yeah. I'll back you, you know, I'll back you hundred percent. Um, so yeah, I, I just, and then I went about, I, I, you know, sorted myself out. I, I truly believe that if I had not taken back control of my life in 2016, 
it was one of the hardest conversations of my life. I I came home from South Shields in Newcastle, uh, where I'd been at a oh. business mentorship. Yeah. I had two broken ribs. I had a broken toe. I had blisters all over my feet. Uh, oh, I'll geez. explain what happened there in a second. <sighs> and I... Yeah, being in your car anywhere in the world at five o'clock in winter in the morning Ooh. is a dark place. Yes. And I went upstairs and I and I told my wife that uh, yeah, uh, that was uh, what I'd been thinking, what I'd been going through, yeah. um, what had happened, and uh, it was scary because I thought she was going to leave me. You know, and uh, she just smiled at me, and that was it. You know, and uh, yeah, I, I truly believe that I would have been, you know, drug addicted, alcoholic, dead, sleeping on the street somewhere. You know, and and that's nothing against anyone homeless. I've been homeless for three weeks. Um, I get that. You know, it's not a hard, uh, not not a not an easy path. But, yeah, I'm thankful every single day that I met the people that I did and took a risk, right, because I still had to do something about it. And I, and I, I really, you know, anyone who's looking at turning their life around, you, you know, you can, like, action beats meditation all day. You can sit there and put up your plans and but you you got to get your foot, you know, one foot in front of the other, and especially when it's hard. You know, there there were days where, I was doing my journaling and, you know, my meditation and and I, I was frustrated and, you know, there was lots going on and all that sort of thing. But the more, the more that I dedicated and set aside the time to just look after, you know, for me, the most important real estate in the world, the yeah. six inches between your ears. Oh. And, and that's what I, that's what I kept telling myself. I was like, you know, come on, like, like, keep doing the work, keep doing the work. You've got to undo decades of conditioning here, decades of opinions and hate and frustration and, you know, and I, yeah, I, I was just fortunate enough to get to a point where I then had other people, you know, start coming to me and say, hey, like, well, what are you doing? And so, well, you know, I meditate and they're like, what? You're like, you know, you're this, you're this big, gruff, you know, loud, very blunt. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I meditate. It actually helps me not want to, you know, punch walls ah. in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, actually, a funny story around meditation, I nearly knocked the monk out that taught me <laughs> in the, within the first five minutes because I got I got so frustrated with him. I, 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 I got to the front of the line and I had this question. I was like, right. I want yeah. you to teach me to stop thinking. And he yeah. looked at me. Ar Arjuna is a fantastic uh, human being from New Zealand. Oh, uh, just one of one of the most beautiful people. <laughs> he is unreal. He's just uh, amazing. And uh, he looked at me like like a needle through water. He just he just looked straight through me, and he's like, "Yeah, you know, I've been I've been I've been meditating a long time, and uh, you know, so I still haven't." Still haven't found out how to do that. So when when you find out, please let me know. And I lost my mind. I nearly strangled him <laughs> because I and and then he was like, "Just calm down. Just you know, sit here." And I woke up an hour and a half later, and he was like, "Wow, you 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 are carrying quite a load on you." I was like, Phew, "Yeah, all the world's problems, my friend. <laughs> you know, everything." And, you know, the meditation <laughs> plays plays a huge, huge role for me. And, uh, yeah, so I, I kind of fell into the, you know, the, the coaching world like that. I, I left my strength and conditioning career working with uh, combat sport athletes and football yeah. players and tennis and, and all these sorts of things. And I, I started helping, you know, busy men, ambitious men and women, you know, take back control of their life. Uh, by by just realizing That's amazing. that work is not your problem. You haven't created the six figure salaries or the great homes, it's and you haven't because work is not your problem. You know, uh, our problem as 
you know, very ambitious people is actually learning when to step away and recover and, and just, you know, not chasing the next mountain, not, not, you know, actually looking back and going, geez, look at all the people I've helped. Look at all the things I've done. Yeah. Wow. Look, you know, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and just sit with it for a moment and actually, and, oof, you know, wow, that feels good because, you know, it's, yeah, I've, 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 it's exhausting chasing the next thing that, that I never realized because that's all I knew, right? I just took the athlete mindset of just chase and try to do it with kids and a wife and a business <laughs> and, you know, trying to get my, Ooh, own, my, own, like my own house in order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just uh, nearly imploded, right? So, yeah, so, so that, that is yeah. the route that I'm on now. That's amazing. That's amazing. And you, you know, you are relentless. You're facing all of these uh, obstacles. You love doing things for charity. You had a good introspection into your life, you know, and you, you really changed your focus. And uh, we talked about a lot of martial arts when you and I were on the video course. Yes. You're a martial artist and I'm a martial artist and we both love to jitsu. And I remember you mentioned something and I found that. Yeah. It was profound to hear that because I've never seen that happen before. You mentioned that yeah. uh, you were fighting, you were 105 uh, kilograms, mm -hmm. and then you were fighting this uh, 66 kilogram athlete. And tell us yes. what happened there because, I mean, I, I yeah. couldn't believe it when I heard it. <laughs> so this, this ties back to me coming home uh, from South Shields in 2016, a few days before my son was born with a broken toe and two broken ribs. So on this business, personal development, you know, get your life together type course that I was on, I, uh, I like, I, I wrestled and I boxed growing up, you know, with a, with a great South African legend, Willie Tawil. And uh, oh. I was, there was a, a jiu-jitsu, a cage fighter there. Um, by the name of Alex Enland, who was the lightweight world champion for, for Cage Warriors. Wow. And he were, he, he kind of took over the belt from my understanding from Conor McGregor before McGregor oh. went to the UFC. I level. And they said, oh, who wants to just jump in the cage with this guy and just roll around a bit? And I was like, oh, all right, I'll give it a go. I, I, you know, not like I'm going to beat this guy or anything. Like, no, no, like not, that was not my idea. I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll – and I was 108 kilograms at the time. I was a fat, overweight strength and conditioning coach telling people to, uh, and athletes and teams to live healthy, and which was extremely hypocritical and quite hilarious looking back. But this 66 kilo man ragdolled me and submitted me 12 times in three minutes broke my big toe, broke two ribs. And when I said to him, I said to him, I said, look, I think we better stop because my, my big toe was like underneath all my little toes. It was a complete mess. I was like, I think I need to straighten this out. And he threw tape at me. He just said, hey, I've just lost my UFC contract because I've got lesions on my brain. Tape it up. Let's go. And I just went, okay, cool. So <laughs> finished that whole thing. Walked out and then I sat down and I was like, what was that? Like, what did we just do in there? And they were like, jujitsu. And I was like, okay, let me understand this. Yes. I'm 108 kilograms and you are what? 66 kilos. Like, yeah, six. And I was like, and I got destroyed and I could not understand it. I was like, I could not wrap my head around the fact that I was nearly twice this man's body weight and he had just yes. thrown me like, I never in my life. So I went back to Oxford. I went and found a jiu-jitsu gym. Um, my good friend, my first professor, Max Campos, uh, who is from Novo Nial in Brazil. Uh, his lineage, uh, he's from the same team as Jose Aldo, uh, one of the greatest UFC champions. And I started training and I went from 108 kilograms to 88 kilograms in one year i lost a ton of weight My goodness. i i yeah I, I just i yeah i just I, I lost a ton of weight i met some great people i started learning a skill and i, I just i couldn't it never ends 
it's just there's always new things to learn and you know people can counter this and then they learn other and i was just fascinated by the whole thing and i've always been a big believer in in a combat sport of sorts boxing more from a self-discipline more from a control of emotion because you know if, if, if you you know especially within the stressful society that we live in uh you know violence is completely misused all the time you know it, it, if someone bumps into your car and you want to shoot them or you want to beat them up but someone will break into your house and you want to talk to them no yeah, no no just not like it, it's a yeah you know, it's not, it, yeah it's it's not violence violence is something you know it's it's a very interesting topic to me uh, uh and and not because i'm a sadist or anything like that I, I, I just think it is a a very misunderstood a very uh it's not taught you know it's not taught like you need violence sometimes to save your life or you need you know a little bit of violence deep down sometimes to just go hey pull yourself together let's move let's get this done you know because you have to show up uh for your family or you you said you would do this you know and 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 i know that it's quite strong and and i know that it can come across as quite quite blunt but it's not it's not something that is just reserved for our first responders it's not you know it's not and and unfortunately you know i I think that a lot of our problems uh in our society would be made better, you know, by by kids starting out from an early age with a form of combat sport, understanding, hey, you know what? Like if someone hits me or bumps into me in the class, doesn't mean they're trying to fight with me. It happens. You know, ah, okay, cool. How do I respond to this? How do I respond? Do I bash his head on the table or do I just go, "Hey, you're right." you know or, okay cool don't worry about it you know and I, I think i think people will be a lot more relaxed and for me given how impulsive i am i love jiu jitsu because if you are impulsive you get caught you know you get caught and and for me it it really it tones down tones down my my i guess my aggression my impulsivity uh, makes me laugh because you know my wife's like hey you need to you need to go to jiu jitsu if i'm getting a little bit and see and that sort of thing and I, and I love it as well because it's a great activity that I do with my boys you know um when we were living in oxford uh we would go every saturday i would just take them you know take alex and danny with me and we would hang out on the mats and danny loves boxing and muay thai so he would go and do that you know all all two and a half years old of him um and alex loves jiu jitsu yeah. And uh, I, you know, and it's not, it's not because I'm a violent person. It's not because I want my kids to beat people up, you know. And 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 all of that actually, that actually helped my oldest son Alex because he got into a scuffle at school with a with a boy who, you know, has some learning disabilities or, or not learning disabilities, more emotional problems. You know, he's a bit of a handful for the teachers. He was eight years old. My son was five, and Alex said, "No, I don't want to play with you anymore." And the boy pulled him out of the treehouse, started stomping on him, and you know, hitting him, and all that sort of thing. And the thing that made me laugh was the teachers said to me, they were like, "Hey, you know, we just want to talk to you about Alex's reaction." And I was like, "Oh, what happened?" They're like, "Well, <laughs> he got up, he got up, he he picked the boy up, and he and he dropped him on his head, and then he knelt on his on his stomach, and said, leave me alone,' and walked away." And I was kind of yeah. sitting there, and I was like. What am I? What what am I missing here? Uh, do you want him to grab a log? Do you want him to grab a brick, and yeah. you know return the favor? I was like, that is conflict resolution by a five year old. This is what we need, mm -hmm. you know. This is what we need. This is this is great. And like, yeah, no. And I was like, guys, what what are we missing here? So, you know, that that's one of the other things that I'm that I'm working on at the moment actually is to start a jiu-jitsu club at my boy's school here in in Spain and just you know just to get you know uh, girls and boys involved and and everyone learning stuff you know and actually uh, that that respect the discipline the routine and just the fun the fun of it you know so yeah that's uh, jiu-jitsu is a a beautiful part of my life i i you know it it foundation for me
foundation. Absolutely, absolutely. And I sit here and I, I'm thinking a million things while you are speaking, and uh, yeah, it, it just stands out that uh, you know martial arts does elevate us. It does do something to our spirit. Uh, it has that effect on everybody that engages with that. So, so thank you for yeah. sharing that. Uh, you know, don't ever underestimate your opponent. That's what came out. To never. Me. I should, I should do that. I shouldn't underestimate my opponent. You should never know. You never know. You uh, so, honestly, uh, it's all so uh, make me laugh. Barry. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So tell me, Barry, uh, you know, you talked about your time in the church. I remember we, yep. we talked about that, um, you know, the things that you kind of went through. And here in particular, we like to keep things real. You know, we mm -hmm. like to talk about the tough stuff. Um, it's yep. important that we do so. So would you like to tell us why, uh, you know, you separated with the church a little bit? What happened? Mm -hmm. There's someone in yeah, the audience sure. that wants to hear this. Yeah. Yeah, so I am... Um so I grew up in uh, a Roman Catholic uh, environment, religion-wise. And the, I mean, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is Latin mass. This is old school, you know, no touching of the bread of Christ, you know, body of Christ. This is take it on the tongue. And I, I, I served, uh, you know, as, a, as an altar boy. Um, I love the ceremony and the tradition and, and just all the, the piousness of it and that sort of thing. And um, it was great. You know, I have no, no regrets about it, um, you know, despite, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the things that, that go on in churches. I, I was never, you know, uh, nothing ever happened to me from priests or Thank anything God. like that. I actually, I had an amazing priest, uh, you know, Father Sebastian Wall who actually, you know, I firmly believe the reason why we got on so well was because he was in the military before going into the seminary, you know, and, and he'd experienced the world, you know, he, he understood both sides. And it wasn't a case of, you know, standing on a pulpit every Sunday and being like, you know, the wrath of God and fire and brimstone. And that's kind of what it was like for me. And I was kind of sitting there and I was like, well, okay, you know, I'll, I'll listen and I'll go to confession and I'll go to catechism and I'll learn. And I did. I enjoyed learning all the mysteries and I, I, I studied Latin. Yeah. But along the way, I was fortunate oh. to have a Latin teacher called Mr. Wilson, who was at King Edward VII School. Yeah. And he was a scholar. You know, I believe by the time he died, he was at the school for, I think, 52 years which wow. is incredible. <laughs> like, and he was, you know, he was someone who was just, you know, he was so, I, I, I had a big problem at high school because I was always told, no, you have to do this. You have to learn this. You have to learn this. I was like, okay, but why? Like, why do I have yeah. to learn this? Like, what is, what is the point here? You know, and that was never tolerated. No, you have to do it. Okay, well, why? And he really engaged me. He gave me books, yeah. you know, Julius Caesar's Conquests of Gaul, and he gave me letters, you know, by Aristotle and all these sorts of things. So I, I was learning and like, and then I kind of started sitting there and I was like, well, okay, I'm not quite getting how all this stuff is evil because that's what the church was telling me on Sunday, right? Yeah. You know, you, this is, you know, you, the, God is the only way and, and that sort of thing. And at the time I started uh, competing uh, at a higher and higher level in rowing. And it was at this time that I was on my way to the junior world rowing championships. And I got home one day and my parents said to me, they said, well, um, the priest, the, the head of the um, uh, church, no, the head of the congregation, um, I, I won't, you know, for professional reasons, uh, mention any names, uh, has said that we have to kick you out of the house before, yes, because you're not, you're not, you're not coming to church on Sunday. It's a mortal sin and you're going to hell and all this sort of thing. And I remember getting in my car, People. driving to the church 
and, you know, banging on the door. And I, I remember the question I, I said to, to, the, to the father, I said, look, okay, I get the, you know, hierarchy of needs here. I need to be in church. It's a mortal sin if I willingly don't come here. Da, 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 da. But please answer this for me. I'm not raping anyone. I'm not abusing anyone. I'm not selling drugs. I'm not out stealing cars. I'm not doing anything violent. I'm using what I understand as a God-given talent to represent my country. How can I be kicked out of my house for this? And he couldn't give me an answer. So I very politely added a few adjectives in and said, I will not step back inside here ever again. And that was it. And uh, yeah, I think... 2012 or potentially 2013. Uh, that was oof, probably 10 years later. 10 years later, my wife just said to me, so, ah, you know, just come, let's go to church for Christmas or something like that. And yeah, that was, I, I stepped back into a church 10 years later. Um, I, you know, I'll be honest, I don't go to church, uh, but I do. I talk, you know, I, I do. I talk to, Whoever's there, very often, you know, through my writing, um, through my meditation, you know, they're, they're definitely, there's, uh, I don't even know if entities are the right word, but I, I, I have, I have this really strange occurrence that happens with me with meditation where I go down into this really beautiful garden and I have a temple and, and I love cherry blossom trees. So Japanese cherry blossom is my favorite, uh, tree. Uh, plant flower and I have these cherry blossoms that sit around there and I have these uh, I guess samurai warriors I, I love Japanese history um, uh, sort of statues there but when I sit down the two people that sit with me are the absolute worst version of myself and the absolute best version of myself they sit down with me when I meditate in this temple and I give them a hug you know, I give them a hug and I say, hi, and, you know, how are you doing? Because I I have that choice every day, right? I, I, I can go. I can go to the worst version of myself or I can go to the best version. I can work towards the best version of myself. And, and that, and that's, you know, to me, I don't know. I don't know if I've manufactured that, but that that's deep. Like that, that's something out there, you know, to me. So, that's that's who I speak with, you know. That's who I speak with. I, uh, I I believe there is something out there. I don't know what it is. I know that we've given it a name in many different denominations over the years. But something that really stuck with me from Mister Wilson was he said to me, he said, "There's a big difference between religion and faith," and 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 that that really that really stuck with me because he said religion breeds fanaticism. He said, look, look, you know, look, look at what's been done in the name of the church or the name of a God throughout history. He said, not just with Christianity or he said the crusades or he said in, you know, the middle of the Amazon jungle, our God says we must do this, you know, and that always stuck with me. And I, and I, and I, you know, I, write his name in my journal every day and thank him for that because it's something that's always stuck with me faith versus religion you know yeah. uh, so I, I would say that I'm a, I'm a I'm a man of faith uh, spiritual faith you know uh, and it's, it's hard uh, I'll be honest it's hard there are days where you know I guess everyone can relate where you you don't you don't have those conversations and you you have to be careful that you don't you don't use your you don't use your faith or your prayer time or your your thinking time as a spare wheel for when things aren't going well, well right? Ah, oh, you know, I just need a bit of help from so-and-so. But, you know, you've kind of been neglecting it. You know, it's, I always say to the guys that I work with, you know, inside relationships, you know, it's not just a case of get into bed and, and kit comes off. You need to work. You need to have the savings account, you know, of effort that's been put in with your partner. Um, you know, and it's, it's the same thing with anything, right? It's the same thing with anything. It, it is, yeah. it is, you know, I, I don't believe that our, our, our faith or prayer or 
time that we spend with whoever we, you know, whether it's in a church or just outside talking, don't treat it as a spare tire, you know, that you just kind of put on when things aren't going well. It's constant work. It's constant conversation. Yeah. I, I hope that answers the question as to, as to why I left. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. I, I agree with everything that you've said, you know, and, and I can see that you are definitely a man of faith and that you know God and you know where your power lies and you realize that uh, it goes beyond religion. It is a relationship. And that means there's hard work yep. that is full and it's a two-way yep. street. And it's a, it's a really a, starting with a new fresh uh, page over every morning, you know. It's a new, yeah, yeah, yeah. new start for us. So uh, think, you mentioned, yeah. 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 No, I, I, I just, you know, something I wanted to point out, it's, it's you know, for, for your listeners, you know, who are individuals or team members, you know, that are pushing for big things that are, that are meticulous, you know, having, you know, pushing on and creating these great things in your life, you do need a spiritual reserve. You know, you need a spiritual reserve, especially in, especially in the times that we're in right now. You know, where you can't even can't even turn on the TV. With, I don't watch the news. I don't watch anything. You know, if I want information, I'll you know go and find it myself. I won't I won't watch the news because it's you know it's, 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 it takes the it takes the, the bounce out of things. You know, and it's like woof. Is there, is there anything nice happening out there? You know, last time I checked, we've got like mountains and sky, oh. and sunsets, and all these things. You know. So yeah, I think I think it's it's really important, you know, to have those reserves physically, mentally, spiritually, you know, and emotionally. Absolutely true, absolutely true. And you know, we go through certain events in our lives, uh, which helps us to realize it's not just about everything out there, it's also what we have here that yep. is important. And you mentioned yep. how your son uh, mm -hmm. really helped you to come back to reality and uh, his mm -hmm. birth, you know, how it changed yeah. you. So it's so beautiful to, to realize that we have that capacity. I think deep down, subconsciously, we know these things. But it mm -hmm. takes life mm -hmm. experiences. It sometimes takes disappointment. Sometimes it takes, uh, you know, celebrations to make us realize what love is yeah. really about, what life is about. And, and I noticed with you, Barry, you love to help people. And that is a passion. Yeah, I love you, it. You know, you, you feel, you've got a charity, you love your children, you build family, and uh, everything that you do is really to uplift people. And that, that is a certain type of leadership that's built in there. That is not something that you can learn. That is something that cultivates. You mentioned wineries. It's something that, that cultivates over the course of your life and over the years. And I'm sure you've had wonderful mentors and leaders in your life as well. So, you yes. know, what advice do you want to give to leaders out there that want to keep on developing personally and professionally? How can they facilitate that? How can they really make sure they stay on mm -hmm. par? They stay abreast of all the developments in the world out there. In the, sure, in the corporate that world? is. It's a great question. You know, I, I believe that my my ability to keep moving forward is because I'm, I'm ready to learn every day. You know, it, yes, you can become paralyzed by too much information and no implementation, but you know, I, I really get clear, you know, who, is, who has what you, what you, what you want to learn, who has it go straight there, you know, give some value to that person first you know, one of the many mistakes I made was say, hey, yeah, I want this. You're like, uh, you can leave, you know, uh, type, type thing. And, and just giving value, you know, and, and help, help solve something for them. You know, just, just be a, be a real person. You know, I really believe that, um, inside the coaching space, the mentorship space, the self improvement space, there are a lot of theorists. There are a lot of people who read books, put marketing courses together. And then sell them to people and, you know, they promise the world and they're completely under the liver, you know, and, and, and that's, that's something that, you know, for those leaders out there, you know, be a practitioner, live, live what you teach, you know, live it, live it hard, you know, and, and, and that's, and that's one of the, you know, the, the, 
when I get asked, you know, sometimes by, you know, men or women, they're like, why should I work with you? I'm like, look, I'm a practitioner. You know, I've, I've got over 50,000 hours of coaching, you know, in my 22 years, whether that's Olympic athletes, whether that's, you know, multi-billionaires, that's not because I'm a business coach. You know, I'm not a business coach. I, I just, I, I understand performance that that's, you know, so, and I practice it, you know, I, I practice it. So that, that would be the, that would be my advice. It's I just, see that. You know, I can see that. Practice it. Practice. Don't be a theorist. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, you are, you are uh, talking in the, in the right frame of mind as well because you realize that you can't dish something out that you haven't got within yourself yeah. as well you can't give you know from an empty vessel like they always say so you develop it yeah. and then professionally you've got your mentors you've got your leader and through mm -hmm. that you help others to do that so that's very very important and thank you for that yeah. advice because i always tell people sure. when we are leaders uh, when we are martial artists or leaders or business owners or coaches we yes. are committed to a life of lifelong learning, professional development, uh, personal development. It's just never going to stop. No. Because the moment that you have this uh, information, uh, you know, under under your um, in your in your your uh, vault of qualities yeah. in your arsenal, they develop something new, and you have to adapt to that. So it's a never-ending story. Now, I wanna yeah. I wanna ask you because you recently oh. fell ill. Um, yes. <laughs> and uh, you know, yeah, woohoo! <laughs> uh, we pressed through this session uh, just for those in the audience that uh, are not aware. I'm going to edit this, but I want to, you know, we keep it real here at Particulars. We we talk about the good stuff. And uh, so during yeah. the course of the session, we had a lot of uh, technical difficulties, but we lasted. And we pressed through, and that is, you know, that is leadership as well, not giving up. Because we could have said, ah, oh, we'll do it another day. But Barry, yeah. John, and I decided, no, 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 it's going to happen today. We're going to make it work. So I want to ask you, Absolutely. you know, you're busy with so many projects and giving yourself to so many people and doing so many, running marathons, Barry, raising children, <laughs> running a business, being a wonderful husband. Yeah. Uh, how do you make time to rest? Uh, yeah. I, I I think that my wife will um, say that I have been resting quite a lot recently. Um, so I had the target <laughs> Thank of uh, of, yeah. of raising some money for Veterans with Dogs, which is a charity in the United Kingdom, whereby they train and house uh, emotional support dogs with veterans who are suffering from PTSD. And my... I just kind of thought, well, okay, well, I have a long family uh, history of military service and I love uh, giving back to the military. Yeah. And I really like dogs. Yeah. So I decided to run uh, or create this marathon combine, which was 10 and a half kilometer run, 10 and a half kilometer on the rowing machine, 10 and a half kilometers on the bike, and then 10 and a half kilometers on the ski erg, which is a ski machine, which is horrendous. And yeah. I wanted to do four of those between uh, last week and now, uh, yesterday. But I unfortunately fell ill with flu uh, on Sunday. So I haven't completed them. And yeah. it boils my blood to have failed at that because I, I don't like failing and I don't like not not achieving. But at the same time, hey, you know, I, day. Like, yeah. there you is always another fail. day. But you didn't yeah, fail. No, I broke yeah. I, I broke two days two days in a row, my, my fastest ten K that I've ever run. Uh which is which is pretty cool. So, you know, for someone who's sitting around 90, 96, 97 kilos, uh that's that's not that's not bad. You know, I was I was pretty happy with that. So look, I think at the end of the day, um I, I like to I like to know you know, I like to do very hard things. I, I just like it. It, it's yeah. it's difficult Challenge and it's yourself. you know yes yeah yeah and <laughs> had it not been for getting flu I probably would have pushed through and done the other two but um, yeah flu is not something to to mess around with to be honest um, yeah heart attacks and all sorts of other bits and pieces that can that can come along with that yeah. and uh, 
yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to be around to, to yeah. see my boys grow up. So, <laughs> and and my wife, and to spend time with my absolutely. Wife. And your wife, yeah, yeah. You know, and there's something that you mentioned. Uh, you broke your record. You know, that's yes. something to be proud of. And we we do realize yeah. that none of us know what tomorrow holds. And a flu no. is not something to to joke around with. You know, it's very very. Um, it's very detrimental to you. It's detrimental to your health to actually put your heart under that strain. If you have yeah. flu, to yeah. actually go and do things like that. So here comes, here comes the fact that you are ambitious. You are fit enough to do it. The will is there. Everything is in place. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, for now, you couldn't complete it. So that doesn't reflect yeah. on you. It shows the wisdom that you have to say, "Well, I'm taking a step mm-hmm. back. Tomorrow is another day." The marathons aren't going to run away. The charity will still happen. Um, and I think that's yeah. important that leaders learn from that as well. And I'll tell you why I yeah. say that. I have a hashtag that I always use. And that mm-hmm. hashtag is never give up. And sometimes mm-hmm. that's not a good thing. Because it's good yeah. to never give up. But I when agree. it starts to become something that's not good for your health, then it's not a good thing. So you find that balance. So I commend you on yeah. that. No, I agree, and 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 you know, I'll be I'll be honest. It's something that I struggle with. I struggle with giving up. I do not like giving up. But it, you know, I, I came across something in a book a while ago. Um, I think it was written by, I think he's a, a former Navy SEAL. Yes, Jocko Willink. Um, he wrote in his book, and he said, "Look, tactical retreat. Tactical retreat is is not giving up. A tactical retreat is stepping back." Yes. You know, thinking about okay, what's yes. the best course of action here, and and then and then pushing on. You know, it doesn't mean that you're a quitter or anything like that. If you if you fail and you choose not to learn the lessons, well, then yes, you are failing. You know, it's like I say to my boys all the time. They're like, oh, I can't do it, and I'm like, you're right. You can't do it. You haven't even tried. You, you need to go and go and go. I said, and exhaust. You know, exhaust every resource that you have. And then 100% come and tell me you can't do it. You know, and that, that's kind of, that's it's kind of a bootstrap my way to where I am right now. You know, it's kind <laughs> of a case of exhaust every resource and then, and then, and then decide. And, and I still haven't found, still haven't found out what I can't do really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I love so that. that. That's something. Yeah. I love that. Barry, John, before I ask you yes. the last two questions, and our session sure. is absolutely just fun, I want to ask you something. Do you know how yes. to speak Afrikaans? I never asked you. Really? Would you like to say something My brain gets so mixed up between Spanish and it. English and Catalan and Afrikaans. I get, that I get very... That was beautiful. Uh, that was beautiful. See, Thank see. you. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. I yeah, want no, to ask you, we've got see. two questions left. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you, what's next for you? Yeah. Well, what's next for me? So right now, I just want to recover. Um, you know, get back to the land of the living and, um, being, being the maniac that I am, I had planned to compete at the European Jiu Jitsu Championships in January, but it's in Paris and I don't know how happy my wife will be with me saying, Hey, I'm going to Paris to go and compete. Uh, why am I not going with, uh, number one, <laughs> but number two, we are also, um, we are also awaiting um, the go-ahead to move into our new home uh, just outside of Barcelona oh. here in Spain. And uh, that, that, that's going to be the next thing for me is, you know, making sure that I'm in a position to get all that off the ground and cupboards installed and, <gasps> you know, my wife, my wife into her home where she can, you know, do do her thing. She's she's an incredible homemaker. Uh, very independent. Very fierce. Very just incredible. I I still she gets a bit irritated with me, but I still turn around some days and I'm like, I still can't believe we're married. And she's like, Oh my word, it's been nearly ten years, you know. Um, <laughs> it's like get over it, type thing. And I'm like, No, it, it really blows my mind, you know, because yeah. I, I I still I still struggle with the fact that I lived 
25,000 kilometers away from her for most of my adult life, you know. And then we we met in Oxford. And the funniest thing is, is that I, I moved over to the UK with uh, uh, an ex-girlfriend at the time. Oh. And when my relationship ended, I was at dinner with my friend, my wife now, Marta, and her friend, Anna, and, and another, my lab partner, Simon, and we were talking, and, and, and I'll never forget it because we were having, we were in a pub, you know, eating a mixed grill. Yeah. Uh, you know, those of you that will get to know me, I, I love meat. You know, nothing against vegetarians. I just, you know, I love meat. Biltong, I'm yeah, dying that's, for Yeah, that's South African part of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And... Um, <laughs> She, you know, I was sat there and I was like, no, nah, I'm done with relationships. I'm just going to do my studying and travel the world. And, you know, I'm going to be a bachelor for the rest of my life. And she sat there and was like, yeah, one day you're going to meet that woman. And she's just going to be everything to you. And then it's going to be all over. And I never, I mean, what are the chances, right? <laughs> that someone who says that to yeah. you ends becomes up, you know, <laughs> yeah, becomes my wife and, and the incredible mother to my three oh. amazing boys. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, mind blowing. Just mind yes, blowing, you know. And it's still something. Yeah, it's just something I think about. Like every every few days, I'm like, "Oh, in the heck did I end up here?" You know, I'm like, "Whoa, what is this?" Yeah, yeah. No, God is good. That is, you know, uh, life is good, and uh, if you keep yourself on the right track and you really stand for what is good and true and noble, that is what happens. And uh, you were blessed. You were blessed as your beautiful wife, absolutely, your amazing, strong wife, and your family. So we cheer yeah. you on on this leadership journey, and I'm so proud to know you. And, uh, to and me audience. too. I'm really happy we connected. Thank you, Barry John. And to the audience, I mean, Barry John and I are going to do amazing things together in the martial arts. We'll yeah. just keep an eye on this uh, space. Watch this space. We are going to pull out a few a few things here. I want to ask you, Barry, what, what mm -hmm. words of wisdom would you like to leave the audience with this evening? Oh, um, wow. Uh, you, you, you know, you've got all power. You've got all wisdom. You've got all knowledge inside you. Um, yeah. You just, you've just yeah. got to be willing. You've just got to be willing to shut the noise out, sit down, mm. and you know, really get clear on what you want. You know, like really get clear on what you want from your life. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I I spent a long time, long part of my life. You know flitting from one thing to the other do it, you know not really going all in not really showing up but you know get really clear on what it is that you want and and for some people it's going to be you know just enough to look after their loved ones and take some holiday time every year for others it's going to be more but you need to decide what that is instead of taking on what what everyone else you know is doing and and that I see a yeah. lot, and that, that's something that I always urge is get get ultra clear. And all it takes is a pen and paper, you know. And if it's not hell yes, then it's hell no. If you're not interested, if you're not curious, if you're not excited by what you're writing down on paper <laughs> for for what you want from your life, then don't do it. Don't just don't even don't even waste the energy. Don't even waste the time because yes. you know energy and time are our most valuable resources, time we don't get back, energy we have to look after, we have to regenerate, we have to recover, we have to go again, especially if you want to create things, you know, that really mean something to you. So, you know, for me, that would be it. You know, listen, sit down and listen. Sit down and listen to what it is. Yeah. Too. Because, you know, if, if, you, if you're not, you know, one of, the, one of the best things I ever heard was from a, a book, that I read by Zig Ziglar and he called the alarm clock, the opportunity clock, you know, and that's something, you know, when my alarm goes off every day, my, my opportunity clock goes off every day. There's a massive misconception with a job that I do that I get out and I do cartwheels and flips and somersaults down the, you know, and I'm like, Hey guys, some days I get up and I just want to, <laughs> you know, frankly, 
pack it all in, grab my backpack, and walk <laughs> off into the mountains. But, but you know what it is? It's, when you feel when you feel like that, that to me, you know, yeah. through my own time spent journaling, my own time inquiring, is the universe just asking you if this is what you really want. You know, when you have those feelings, it's like, okay, is this what you want? Because if it is, this is just a feeling. You yeah. need to get back in control and you need to, you know, focus on what you want and, and look at the exciting things you've got in your day. And and I think that, you know, yeah. tying this off is is one of the big things. I don't believe people set exciting days, weeks and months and years up. That's why they don't finish their targets. That's why they don't complete, you know, the things that they want to complete because they're not excited. You know, they're not excited by what they are going through. So, you know, that, that for me is, is, is really it. You know, that's really it. That, that's what keeps me moving forward. Beautiful. Some days I'm sprinting. Some days I I'm just taking this. one step at a time. Yeah. Well, that's, the, that's life, right? As long as we don't give up, as long as we just uh, continue moving forward and cheering each other on. And that's what the yes. most ridiculous moments audience, you know, we're going to do that for you. We're going to so follow you Appreciate on social that. media. You. We're going to network with you and uh, support Brilliant. you. And uh, I look forward to our adventures together as martial yes. artists. And yes, uh, thank yes, you yes. so much for spending your time with us. <laughs> I appreciate you giving me your time and, and for giving me access uh, to, you know, share my, share my journey with your audience. It means a lot. And Merry Christmas Wonderful. and all that sort of thing. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate I it. love that. Merry Thank Christmas, you, Sherry. Merry Christmas. Thank you. <laughs> and to Christmas. the meticulous moments audience. We'll see you in the next session. And uh, thank you for joining us. And like Barry John said, Merry Christmas. We'll see you on the other side. Goodbye. Bye.